This video brought to you by Gamefly. Go to GameflyOffer.com slash HaloCanon for a 30-day free trial. Stick around to the end for more details. Welcome back, Canonites. Last Tuesday was supposed to be the release of Halo Tales from Slipspace, but it seems that the publisher, or 343, or someone, really dropped the ball with these release dates. Originally slated for October 25th, the date for the physical edition had mysteriously been pushed back to November 29th, December 1st in the UK, while those who pre-ordered the Kindle edition still received it on the 25th as intended. Weirder still, though, is that the Kindle date changed midday on the 25th, so anyone who hadn't ordered it before the Switch now has to wait for November 29th as well. I don't know what happened, but especially after the weird publisher debacle with Halo Mythos, this is getting ridiculous. Anyway, I managed to pre-order the Kindle edition the day before it was originally scheduled to release, so today we're going to take a look at the second ever Halo anthology comic, Halo Tales from Slipspace. As always, I'll be getting into spoilers with this, so if you want to wait, click the on-screen annotation or check the description box below for the timestamp and skip to the spoiler-free wrap-up at the end. Or close the video now, whichever works best for you. For everyone else, this is Halo Tales from Slipspace. Our first story is titled, Something Has Happened. If the title wasn't enough, this story follows Serena aboard the Spirit of Fire prior to Halo Wars 2 and serves as a follow-up to the end of Halo Escalation Issue 6. Set in January of 2537, we find Serena just about to hit her seventh year, waking up specialist Violetta Maldini to inspect the spirit's systems. Not long into her inspection, Maldini is attacked by the one rogue infection form and turned into a combat form. In response, Serena locks down the sector Maldini was in and observes her for the next few days. Three days in, though, Maldini's back bloats up and explodes with new infection forms. This is actually a nice callback to the way the Flood was described in Defender of the Storm from Halo Fractures. Anyway, thanks to Maldini's knowledge, the Flood is able to awaken Spirit crew in the lockdown sector and infect them, slowly building an army. In response, Serena awakens Anders, not wanting to wake up Cutter. Fifteen minutes later, Jerome is awoken by a subroutine programmed in the event Anders was awoken, a seemingly random precaution, but one that obviously pays off. As Jerome fights the now 34 combat forms in the lockdown sector, Serena requests that, once the Flood is dealt with, Anders prepare her for final dispensation. She explains that she's already started to show the early signs of rampancy and doesn't want to make errors that may cost lives again in the future. Just as Jerome is tracking down what appears to be the last of the combat forms, he finds it carrying a number of infection forms and is nearly overwhelmed. Thankfully, he's saved when Serena opens the airlock. With the flood now taken care of, Jerome and Anders head back into cryo, saying their final goodbyes to Serena. Serena, meanwhile, prepares a number of pre-recorded contingency briefings for Cutter based on probable scenarios, makes an after-action report concerning the Flood outbreak for Anders and Cutter's eyes only, then initiates Final Dispensation. This story was a really powerful way to start the anthology, really well drawn, and a wonderful send-off to Serena in lieu of an actual in-game send-off. If you followed some of my pre-Halo Wars 2 speculation, I was really hoping for a game set during the Covenant War, set around 2537 actually. Anyway, while good, the comic does have some downsides. For one thing, it's basically the final nail in the coffin for all of Chris Schlurf's contributions to Halo. As many have said before, Halo 5 seems to ignore Halo 4's ending, and while that's not entirely true, it's certainly a radical shift from what many expected. Something has happened basically erased what Schlurf seemingly set up during Escalation with the appearance of the Spirit of Fire, reading us of that pesky infection form. The comic also features the BR-85 rather than the BR-55, and again shows Mark IV with built-in thrusters. While both of these have in-universe explanations, they are retcons I'm seriously not a fan of. Moving forward, the next story is Fireteam Majestic Poker Night, a fairly literal title. Basically, Thorne finds the rest of Majestic playing poker one night, using DeMarco's energy sword as part of the bets. Thorne joins in and wins the sword, just as Majestic is ordered to deploy for a new mission. While not terrible, I rather enjoyed the passing of the torch theme, this is not a tale to be relegated to a short story. This should be its own issue, or perhaps even two issues. The rather abrupt ending did little to help, too. After that, we have On the Brink, what was easily my least favorite of the stories. This comic follows Blue Team during a mission in early 2558. Some Covenant managed to hijack a mammoth and set it on a collision course with a nuclear reactor. Short story shorter, Blue Team manages to miss the reactor, just barely, while saving civilians trapped on board. 
In the aftermath, one of the personnel gets pissed off, and Fred starts shouting right back, completely out of character. Fred has been through a lot worse, even being accused of murder back on Gao. But this is what sets him off? No, I don't fucking believe it. Not for a second. You know what the real Fred would have said in this situation? Sorry, next time we won't miss or something like that. It won't court-martial all of us, right? That is Fred. Not whatever this is. Anyway, the comic ends with Kelly reflecting on how steadfast the Chief seems, but speculating on how long it will be before he cracks. Which basically reads as 343 saying, See? See? We don't just didn't forget about Halo 4's ending. So, yeah, I really didn't care for this story. It's pointless, it incorrectly depicts characters, and to make it all worse, the art is really damn good. Seriously, I want to see this artist return to the Halo universe in the future. Hopefully with better material next time. Oh, and why the hell do Blue Team have their helmets off in the final panels? I've ragged on this before, but come on. I can understand Spartan 4 is constantly taking their helmets off, but it doesn't make any sense for the 2s, and even less sense when all of Blue Team does it, but the Chief never does. And don't even try to tell me it was for the sake of conveying emotion. Rooster Teeth have been conveying emotion through helmets alone for years. Surely a gifted artist like this can do it in a comic. Moving on, our next story is called Undefeated, and follows the crew and passengers of a cargo ship just as the created uprising starts. As Cortana sends out her invitations to AI across the galaxy, the Nereid drops out of slipspace and loses power. How isn't all that clear? I personally thought that it was the ship's AI jumping ship to join Cortana. Others have said it looks like a Guardian attack. The comic only refers to it as a multi-channel cyber warfare attack. Anyway, the passenger is a mix of marines and a construction crew, and the ship's crew now have to work together with very limited time and air to try and either power their ship or get it moving. To make things worse, the ship's commander was killed when the ship lost power, leaving Lieutenant Commander Elaine Coffey in a tenuous position of command. Things work out for a while, with the crew and passengers using cycles to power the air and water filters while looking for ways to generate heat. However, after several weeks, the Marines, led by Major Kelly Tanris, are tired of waiting and have an idea to use one of the Hornet construction mines to jumpstart the slipspace drive. Coffey is skeptical of the effectiveness of the plan, but agrees to help. Sadly, the plan fails, leading to further tension between the Marines and the ship's crew. From there, things continue to decline until Major Tanris decides to take over. Coffey and those of her crew and the construction crew that haven't been captured hole up with a bunch of weapons and Hyperion missiles. When the Marines break in, Coffey threatens to blow up a missile unless the Marines stand down. However, Tanris is hit with inspiration, using the missiles as brute force propellants. The crews come together to make the plan work. However, a few days in, Tanris realizes that the yields of the missiles far exceed the cargo ship's shield rating and confronts Coffey. Coffey reveals that she knew all along and this was the only way to keep the crews from infighting. The story ends with Tanris seeing things Coffey's way, the two drinking to hope, even if it is a false hope. This story was one of the best in the anthology, if not the best. A great human drama with wonderful characters and a sort of dilemma that, while not uncommon to sci-fi, hasn't been seen in Halo before. This story also presents a human-on-human -human conflict that isn't UNSC versus insurrectionists or colonists or whatever. In addition, the artwork is solid, and I think that the story got the exact number of pages that it needed. As an interesting side note, the design for the cargo ship is actually a fan-made frigate design by Calamity Psy. Likely, the artist for this story used Google when looking up Halo ship references. You can check the description box if you want to see the original artwork. Special thanks to Unicracken from Sins of the Prophets for pointing that out. Our next story is called Hunting Party and is our formal introduction to Atriox in the fiction. Set sometime after the war, the story follows Ressa Azavale and his Spec Ops group as they are hunting down and eliminating brute forces. As a fun easter egg, their hunt even takes them to Rapid Conversion, the CCS-class battlecruiser The Glassed Harvest, and that Tartarus took control of after killing his uncle, Machibius, and claiming the Fist of Rukt. Anyway, the group's current mission takes them to Elegy's Lament, a corvette under the control of the Banished. The Spec Ops group kills their way to the bridge where they're confronted by Atriox himself. And here is where we see the brilliance of Atriox. He offers the Sunkelion out, a path where they're free of the shackles of their old faiths, free of the leash of petty vengeance, free to pursue their own ends. Most of Ressa's group are convinced, but Ressa himself is stout in his ways. As a result, the team kills him and joins Atriox. This was easily tied for my favorite story in Tales from Slipspace. Here we see Atriox for who he is, we see his beliefs and goals laid bare, and we see why others, even Sangheili, would want to join him. Further, the story of Ressa is rather saddening. 
a Sangheili warrior with no clear path, only honor and vengeance. It's a wonderful story with beautiful art to accompany it, and the return of the Headhunter style Spec Ops armor and red energy swords is certainly welcome. After that we have Knight Takes Bishop, which may end up being one of the most controversial stories in the collection. The story follows Headhunter G059 as they hunt down Avumet Talcum, leader of the Servants of the Abiding Truth. Interestingly, the mission briefing on the first page reveals a redacted second target, possibly a reference to Dural Umdama, Chul Umdama's son. Anyway, long story short, the Spartan 3 is deployed to the glass colony of New Lanelli and eliminates Telcom. The story is told almost entirely through visuals and, in my opinion, was rather okay. Sadly, I know many won't care for this, especially after Jewel Umdama in Halo 5. Though, speaking of Halo 5, one could argue that it was hinted at in a piece of intel. Who will left to speak it indeed? Seems the responsibility might fall to Dural. The final story in this anthology is called Dominion Splinter and tells the story of Cortana and the Warden Eternal meeting for the first time. In here we learn that the Cortana we encounter in Halo 5 appears to be the reassembled fragments she split off in Halo 4. These fragments find themselves in the domain with no explanation still and basically trick the Warden and take over the domain. It's a rather strange turn of events as it seems like Cortana just finds the domain and decides, yeah, I'm going to take over the galaxy. While she and the Warden have a long conversation with Cortana even quoting the Gravemind in a few places, it's all revealed in the end that one fragment was distracting the Warden so others could basically break into the domain. So even though these are rampant fragments and I'm happy to know the Cortana we lost in Halo 4 is not this Cortana, I still don't know how to feel about this. Even for rampant fragments, this is a rather sudden change in character. It's not Cortana being persuaded to take a new path during a moment of weakness, it's Cortana deciding, hey, I'm going to take over the galaxy without any clear motivation. And we still don't know exactly how she found her way into the domain, which is what we were hoping for when this story was announced. I wanted to enjoy this, but I simply can't. Frankie, I think, really dropped the ball with this. So that's Halo Tales from Slipspace. I think it was a worthwhile buy, but the content is overall mediocre. Something has happened was nice overall, but it kills what remains of Chris Schlurf's contributions to Halo. Fireteam Majestic Poker Knight has good intentions, but the short length hurts the story it wants to tell. On the Brink was just terrible, which is sad because the art is fantastic. Undefeated was the highlight of the anthology with a small character-driven story set right at the end of Halo 5. Hunting Party was an extremely close second for my favorite story, giving a powerful introduction to Atriox. Night Takes Bishop was enjoyable for me, though it certainly will be less liked by others. And Dominion Splinter was a letdown. Just a straight up letdown. Going over every story, considering story and art, my final rating for Tales from Slipspace is a 6.5 out of 10. There are some really good stories in there, a couple decent ones, and a couple bad or disappointing ones. As I said, I think this still warrants the purchase, and overall, it's some of the best work Dark Horse has produced for the Halo license. Still, I'm kind of disappointed with the final product. The comic anthology suffers from the same problem that in some ways harmed Halo Fractures. Too many stories in too few pages. While Fractures was good despite this, Tales from Slipspace was undeniably hurt by it. If 343 and Dark Horse decide to do another anthology, I hope they either reduce the number of stories within or give the writers significantly more pages to work with. Well, that's it for this review. What did you think of Tales from Slipspace, assuming you have it because of the seriously messed up release schedule? Or maybe you're here in December, in which case I ask the question again. Regardless, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching as always, and until next time, this has been Halo Cannon. Thanks for watching. Be sure to give a like and consider subscribing and sharing this video around. Also consider checking out Gamefly, with over 8,000 new releases and classic games for current and previous gen consoles, and even some older consoles, Gamefly is a great way to try tons of games without buying them. Go to GameflyOffer.com slash to start your 30-day free trial.